Hello, Ghana. The GCK flight comes to the coastal capital city of Accra in Ghana. The land of freedom and rich diversity is set to experience God's freedom and diverse miracles. From around the world, we connect with international gospel evangelist, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumye at the April edition of the Global Crusade, themed Glorious Visitation from Christ. Get set to encounter the wonder-working power of Jesus Christ as He visits us from April 20th through April 25th, 2023 at 1600 hours GMT daily and global worship service at 0700 hours GMT on Sunday. An exclusive conference for Christian ministers, church workers, and corporate professionals will be held on April 21st, 22nd, 24th, and 25th, where Jesus Christ anoints them with enabling grace and power for end time harvest. The young eagles are not left behind too at the Impact Academy for teenagers, campus students, and young adults on April 22nd. The GCK convener will propel them to the sky and fly upward to higher heights. Out of Independent Square, Accra, Ghana, the word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world an engaging worship led by Jared Anderson. This is our final battles. 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 This is our... It is your time for a life-changing experience. Tough times don't last forever. There is no doubt that we are all tired of the sorrows, pains, and deadness pervading the land. I have good news for you. Christ has come to guarantee true change this April at the Deeper Life National Easter Retreat. It's your time to experience Christ's resurrection power. From Thursday 6 to Monday 10th, April 2023, Join the nearest Deeper Life Retreat location around the globe. Christ's power will be unveiled by Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui and other anointed men of God. Everyone is welcome. The retreat time is a time of waiting before the Lord. I want to plead with you. Be present in every session. The Lord will fill your cup to overflowing. Come and taste of Christ's resurrection power. It's real. Amen. Shall we rise up to pray? Let's talk to God in prayer. Appreciate the goodness of God in your life. Let's thank God for the gathering at this time. What the Lord has done in each of our lives. What the Lord will still do as we continue in his presence. Let's rejoice for the wonderful benefit of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bless the name of the Lord for the expectation of his coming. Our God is good. We thank God for his mercy and his favor upon our lives. Let us pray. Father, we bless you. We worship you. We honor you. We appreciate your goodness in each of our lives. Receive our appreciation. Receive all the glory in Jesus' name. Eternal God, thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you for the plan of redemption that brought hope to lost man greater benefits than what Adam lost. 
we appreciate Christ coming to the world to undertake for us to deliver us from the dominion of sin and the power of Satan. We thank you for the hope of eternal rest in your kingdom. We thank you for giving us better, better opportunity than what Adam heard. Adam was dwelling here below in the Garden of Eden, but we have been given assurance that we shall dwell with you in your kingdom. For this, we praise your holy name, accept our appreciation and gratitude in Jesus' name. Righteous Father, we come before thee, and we pray that as we go into your word, your spirit will minister to our hearts. Lord, give us understanding. Lord, let there be no presumptuous attitude in any of us. Open heart, open mind to receive your word. Let this word bring transformation, cleansing. Let your word prepare us for your coming. Make us ready, make us fit for your kingdom in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let us please be seated. We are looking at a message that is titled, The Steadfastness of Rapturable Saints. The Steadfastness of rapturable saints. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us all that we need to know in preparation for his coming. We turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 36 through to verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour, knoweth no man no, nor the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until that day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore. This information necessitates watchfulness. Watch, therefore. No presumption. Watch, therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. In verse 44 through to 46. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom is Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. How I pray that at his coming, he will find us ready and fit in Jesus' name. These are the things that serve as preamble for the coming of the Lord. 
and we are seeing them in our days, eating and drinking, festivities, ceremonies, are uh, now the order of the day, and uh, fashion parade, pursuit after money, politics, and whatever. Those are the things that are very prevalent in our days. But Jesus is saying we should watch because these things, activities, have the capacity to draw our mind away from the Lord, to preoccupy us with mundane things of this world, ephemeral things, things that seem to have value in the eyes and the sight of men, but things that have no value before the Lord, that we should watch and be careful. In addition to being watchful, is the assignment that the Lord has given unto us. Said he has committed responsibility to watch over his household and to give them their meat in due season. A faithful servant will perform. A faithful servant will obey. A faithful servant will carry out his duty, her duty. But if we neglect, if we overlook, if we get preoccupied with other things that he has not committed into our hand, his coming will be sudden, and that can lead to great disappointment. So he said, be ye ready. In our text, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ hinted on very important facts as follows. One, the certainty of his unannounced sudden return. The certainty of his unannounced sudden return. Number two, the situation of the world that is not prepared for his return. The situation of the world that is not prepared for his return. Number three, the faithfulness of dutiful and watchful servants. The faithfulness of dutiful and watchful servants. How I pray that God Almighty will help us to remain faithful and dutiful. Paul the Apostle also emphasizes the necessity of being steadfast in our commitment. We turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we read verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I pray our labor will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Personal reflection on our daily work with God. Consistent obedience to the word of God. Commitment to the work of the Lord. And what full analysis or the fulfillment of prophecies are important to our readiness for the rapture. These, these essential factors are summed up in the message we are considering, titled, The Steadfastness of Rapture Ready Saints. The Steadfastness of Rapturable Saints. Wherever the fear of God rules the heart, it will show, it will manifest in piety, in godliness, in holiness, in righteousness. 
and in good works. In fact, we are made to understand that Jesus Christ gave himself to redeem us from all iniquities and to purify unto himself a peculiar people. And that redemption and the purification is going to bring forth something. It's going to qualify us for service. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. So where we actually have the fear of God, I'm talking of referential fear. The fear that makes us to flee from evil. When the fear of God rules our heart, our life will be governed by righteousness. And we will be involved in good works, doing it zealously. Actually, the fear of God and the works of righteousness are the substance of true religion. It is the evidence of the effect of faith, of grace in our lives. The grace of God in our hearts and in our life is the manifestation of living right and serving God zealously. It is, however, necessary to urge believers to examine their spiritual state, whether piety, godliness, righteousness is still in place, whether commitment is still in place, whether consecration is still in place, or whether religious activities have taken the kernel away, leaving mere husk, which in the sight of God has no value. There are certain factors for proper evaluation of our, of our steadfastness, which we shall highlight and examine as we delve into this message. Number one, working in his sunshine in readiness for his coming. Working in his sunshine in readiness for his coming. Number two, working, service. Working in his vineyard in readiness for his coming. Number three, Weighing, evaluating our commitment in readiness for his coming. We look at point one. Walking in his sunshine in readiness for his coming. Turn our Bible to Malachi. Let's turn our Bible to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. We are going to read verse 2. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as cows of the stall. Jesus Christ succinctly declares, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that follow me, he that follow me, 
shall not walk in darkness because he is the light. And if we are following him, if we are walking with him, we shall not, we shall never walk in darkness. We shall be in the light as he is in the light. That's why he said, he that follow me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Our entrance into abundant life uh, is at salvation. When we turn away completely from all iniquities, when we receive forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to God, Jesus Christ, the light that lighted every man that cometh into the world, begins to shine in our heart, just as we have read in Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 2. In his life, true believers maintain steady work in the Lord. In his life, true believers work and serve in the vineyard of God. In First John chapter 1, verse 7. First John chapter 1. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we walk in the light, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's back up to verse 6 of that same First John chapter 1 verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Walking in darkness and claiming to have fellowship with God is contradiction in time because God is light. In him there's no darkness. And so the man, the woman, the boy, the girl that is claiming to be in the light and is walking in darkness is lying. That's why we are admonished in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We are going to read verse 11. Ephesians 5 verse 11. Please open your Bible. We are told in scripture, the entrance of your word gives light. It's good we see what God has sent to us as written for us. And then we read it, we let it sink into our heart. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Remember, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with the Father. And our fellowship is also with one another and the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we say we are walking in the, in the light, and there is work of darkness, which the Bible will reveal to us shortly. He said we lie. No truth in us. What are they? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, backbiting, evil speaking, slander, evil speaking, lying, evil speaking, gossip, evil speaking, 
All evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. If we claim that we are walking in the, la- in the light, these evil things will not be in our lives. James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, reading from verse 14. James chapter 3, verse 14. James chapter 3, verse 14. But if ye have bitter envy and strive in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Somebody says, I'm walking in the light. And these evil works are there in the heart, in the life of the individual. The Bible says that's not true. That's a lie. It's not possible. Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we are reading verse 15. Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another. If we are biting, backbiting, slander, gossip, backstabbing, we cannot claim to be walking in the light. In fact, we cannot be doing the thing that God hates and declare that he hates and reveal that he hates and still be claiming that we are in fellowship with God. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16 all through to 19. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are abomination unto him. A proud look a lying tongue, and hand that shed innocent blood through abortion, by poisoning, or by wicked acts, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, wicked imagination, unclean imagination, immoral imagination, feet that is swift, in running to mischief a false witness that speaketh lies. And he that sweat discord among brethren, he that knock the head of two friends together and scatter them, she that knock the head of husband and wife together and scatter them. He says, These are abomination in the sight of God, these are evil. First John chapter 2. In First John chapter 2, let us read in verse 9. The Bible is replete with caution and warning that we should not be presumptuous. That when we see this thing, if we ever see such a thing in our life, we should not claim we are saved. We should run to Calvary and wash and be made whole. We should let our sin be blotted away because they will not enable us, allow us to go at the rapture. It is an indication of not being ready, not being prepared, not preparing for the coming of the Lord. First John chapter 2 verse 9. In First John chapter 2 verse 9. He that said he is in the light and hated his brother. Is in darkness even until now. He that claimed to be a child of God but has hatred against his brother, against another believer, 
against a real, a relative, whatever it is they have done. He said that fellow is in darkness because we are to forgive offenders. We are to let the blood of Jesus wash our hearts so that we don't, have, we don't retain any desire to retaliate any unforgiveness within. No, we let go. Verse 11. But he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth. He's claiming, she's claiming that she's going to heaven, but no, he doesn't know where he's going because he's walking in darkness. Darkness has blinded his mind, blinded his thought, blinded his action, blinded his perception. He does not know where he's going. She does not know where he's going because that darkness has blinded his eyes, has blinded our eyes. Chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. 1 John chapter 3, in verse 15. Whosoever hated his brother in his, is a murderer. Stop there for a moment. How many mothers have we get to heaven? Not one. Except they have repented and their sins are washed away. But look at it here. Whosoever hated his brother in his heart is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. No murderer abortionist has eternal life abiding in her. A killer. A, a murderer has no hope of heaven without repentance. Chapter 4, and you see here, it's talking about murder in the heart through hatred, through bitterness, through unforgiveness. Unforgiving, refuse to forgive offender. Chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 20, 1 John chapter 4, we are reading verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How can I love God? But there's hatred. I will not greet him. I will not talk to him. I will not forgive him. No. That's contradiction in time. You can't be of God and retain offense in the heart and refuse to forgive offenders. First John chapter 1, I'm reading verse 5. First John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Let's for a moment just imagine the sun, the sun that shines. Do you see spot of darkness in the sun? It's not even possible to look at it directly. Even if you, you wear sunshade and you look directly at it, you will not see spot of darkness because it's all light. And the Bible is telling us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Can somebody, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, be involved in all these evils and still claim to be saved? What answer do you have? A person that has bitterness in the heart, a person that gossip and backbites, a person that will not forgive offender, can he or she claim to be saved? Didn't you remember that Jesus said, if you don't forgive those who offend you from your heart, neither will your father, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. Can somebody be gossiping, be cheating, be backbiting, have animosity, evil desire, pornography, masturbation, and still be claiming to be saved? No, not at all. Come with me to Malachi again. Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, in verse 2. Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, the fear of God, is to depart from evil. 
The fear of God is to depart from iniquity. The fear of God is to hate what is evil. And if a person says he has the fear of God, he will depart from iniquity. He will depart from unrighteousness. He will depart from ungodliness. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise. He is the light that lights every man that comes to the, into the world so that we can walk in this light. He, he said, I'm the light of the world. He that walks with me will not walk in darkness. He that followeth me will not walk in darkness. And if there's any stain of darkness, that's sufficient evidence that that individual is not walking in the light. The sun of righteousness shines into our souls through the sacred word. And also, we keep communion with God through the sacred word. The word of God is the center of our relationship with God. He guides us, he instructs us, he directs us, illuminates our mind and tells us this is the way walk therein. He's the word of God that is the road map to heaven. He's the word of God that prepares us for his kingdom. This is the meaning of walking in the light. And as we walk in his word, as we walk in the truth, our relationship with God continues to flourish. In fact, our devotional life, very important. Our devotional life, very important. That's how we walk in the light. Maintaining rich devotion. Our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated that practical intimacy with God is greater than activity. Practical intimacy with God is greater than activity. Activity, activity, activity. And uh, the Lord of the work is not cons consulted. No communion, no intimacy, no fellowship. That activity lacks value. Maybe just like chaff. Because what makes our endeavors in the vineyard of the Lord to have value is our intimacy with him, our communion with God, our regular prayer. In Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Mark chapter 1 in verse 35. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. He went to a solitary place, and there prayed. The richness of our devotion reveals the depth of our love for God. It is by this means, regular devotion, that we keep up a believing expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Fresh devotion, fresh renewal. Our expectation is brightening every day. As we come to communion with God, the Spirit of God reminds us, be prepared, be prepared. And if there's any stain, anything that needs immediate attention correction, we do it promptly. Because as we come into fellowship with God, regularly and consistently, our life is renewed and refreshed. At the end of every ministerial outing, Jesus Christ will separate himself for a period of prayer. In Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone, alone with the Father praying, alone communion with the Father. In Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Mark chapter 6, verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get 
into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. He departed into a mountain to pray. That's, that was his lifestyle. That was his habit. That was his practice. In Luke chapter 11 and in verse 1, Luke 11 verse 1, let's open our Bible. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. This act of consistent personal prayer sets an example and pattern for us. Steadfast commitment cannot be sustained without spending time in prayer, in meditation for renewal, without having communion with God consistently. This is because commitment can decline gradually. If it is not renewed by fresh consecration, it can decline, depreciate. That brings us to the second point. Walking, serving, walking in his vineyard, in readiness for his coming. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, we are reading verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He gave himself for this purpose, salvation of mankind, holiness in our life, in order for us to be fit for service, in order for us to be involved zealously in good work. And what is the work we are to do? Number one of priority is preaching the gospel. In Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, we're reading in verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In John chapter 20, reading in verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. He was sent to preach the word for the salvation of mankind. He was sent to sacrifice life for our redemption. And he's saying, go forth and preach the word now. The sacrifice made, the door to salvation is open. The blood, my blood has been shed for the remission of sin. Go proclaim the word. Our call into salvation and holiness is a call to service as a healthy tree that is planted on fertile ground. is expected to bear fruit. So must every believer that is walking in the light Jesus Christ gave an illustration in John chapter 15, verse 4. John chapter 15, verse, in fact, let me start from verse 1. John 15, verse 1. I am divine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth 
more fruits. You can see service, commitment, labor in the vineyard of the Lord. In verse 4 of John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, so no more can ye, except ye abide in me, because he is the vine, the trunk, and from him we get nourishment. That's why devotion is so important. Intimacy and communion with him is so important, so that we receive refreshing regularly, consistently, and promptly. Verse 5, I am divine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Verse 8 is very important. Hearing is my father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciple. Fruit bearing gladdens the father, delights the heart of the father. It is a duty to go forth and to proclaim the gospel and bear fruits and bear fruits this is our assignment this is our commitment commitment in the vineyard of god is a great opportunity a great privilege for every disciple of jesus christ to lay his treasure up above to lay her treasure up above we know fully that is coming again with eternal reward for all our labor. We are told in Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, as we read in verse 12, Revelation 22, and in verse 12, and behold, pay attention, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Amen. We are not laboring in vain. There's reward that is amassing, that is awaiting us, that should create the appetite, that should serve like an elixir, a catalyst that will make us to want to do more because we know we shall be rewarded. We are witnessing a special move of God in these last days and each of us has unique role to play. In the ongoing global crusade, the place of prayer, thanksgiving, appreciation, supplication, intercession, is calling for volunteers, ICT, technical experts, and graphic designers are needed, translators, editors, and interpreters are insufficient. Lumiere's drama group needs more hands. Financial supply <laughs> is inadequate. Sponsors are needed. And uh, each of us should step out, should make decisions, should join the army of the law, should volunteer in the soldier of the law. In Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 15. In Second Chronicles, Chapter 15, reading verse 7. Second Chronicles chapter 15, in verse 7. Be ye strong therefore, and let not your hand be weary, 
Let not your hand be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. For your work shall be rewarded. Maybe we say it personally. For my work shall be rewarded. The question is, what kind of reward are you laboring to get? What kind of reward are you expecting? What's the value, the worth of your commitment? First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 29 and in verse 5. First Chronicles chapter 29 and in verse 5. The gold for things of gold. The silver for things of silver. And for all manner of work to be made by the hand of the artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service? To consecrate her service this day unto the Lord. It's not service to man. It's not service to a church. It's not service to an individual. It is a service unto the Lord. The question is, who is willing? Who then is willing to consecrate a service this day unto the Lord? Global gospel campaign or mass evangelism can be likened to war strategy with area bombardment. Soldiers cannot claim conquest through area bombardment alone without grand combatants. It is the grand soldier, full soldier, the combatants, who will comb the area and take possessive control of the territory. That is what personal evangelism look like. That is why personal evangelism must be joined to mass evangelism. That's why we can't separate one from the other. We cannot say because we are doing global gospel campaign over and again, therefore we relax and then we go and rest on our own. No, not at all. Personal evangelism remains our individual responsibility. Even after global gospel campaign, Jesus said in Mark 16 verse 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in Luke chapter 24, in Luke chapter 24, Reading verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins must be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Where you are, where I am, where we are, is our Jerusalem. And he said in verse 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Ye are witnesses of these things. We must continue to reach out with the good news to all that we come in contact with we must present the word of God by life, by words, by deeds. In Philippians chapter 2, Reading verse 16, Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in, in vain, neither labored in vain. I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Second Timothy, a charge, a command, a mandate. In Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. Exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. This is a mandate, a duty for every one of us. Follow up of crusade converts is the key to retention, conservation, and integration of converts. Just like the grand soldiers, we comb the entire landscape in order to take possession. That's the way we go out after the converts to ensure that we help them to stand. We enlighten them. There are things to teach them how to pray, how to read their Bible, how to say no to the temptation, how to refuse to separate from a former sin partner, how to separate themselves from things that made them to fall back to sin again. That is why we must do it promptly, quickly, consistently, committedly, and back it up with prayer. We are praying for them, that God will establish them, we are uh, touching their lives, we are encouraging them, and in these days when we can easily send a uh, text through SMS, through WhatsApp, through uh, various medias, all the area of duty, include teaching new converts to make them disciples of Jesus Christ, Rec recruiting train personnel into the working team and encouraging weary believers. All these are areas of service that shall attract reward from the Lord. All these are preparatory and readiness for his coming. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, verse 36, Luke chapter 12, verse 36. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall guard himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And he will come forth and serve them. Because they are found ready. Verse 38. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, Blessed are those servants. More also, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shown toward his name, in that ye have ministered in the past, to the same and do minister in the present. That's to say, we do not rest on our own. We do not rest on the yesteryear activities. We renew our commitment and still minister more and more and more. The Holy Spirit, through Paul the Apostle, admonishes us to be diligent and to remain steadfast in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 8. 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, increasing in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All our endeavors must be in readiness for his coming. We round up as we consider weighing your commitments 
in readiness for his coming. Weigh in your commitment in readiness for his coming. Paul the Apostle left for us great example, encouragement, instructions, admonitions. First Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 26, and every man that striveth for mastery, I'm reading from verse 25, and every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that bitter the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Let that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That's regular checkup. Regular checkup. You know, he says something in Acts 24, 16. He says, hearing, do I exercise myself? This is what I do regularly. To have a conscience void of offense, free from all offense, between me and God and between me and others. Upward and reaching to others. Regular personal evaluation of our endeavors in the vineyard of the Lord is very necessary. In fact, Paul the Apostle challenges us, encourages us in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I can't know myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, forgetting all that has been accomplished. We did this, we did that. We praise God for that. But then we reach forward to things that are still ahead. I press toward the man. For the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark. Brethren, it is very necessary that we are encouraged. We are challenged to press on, to move on. However, we must ensure that our vessels are clean for our service to be acceptable unto God. Because... Services that are rendered with defilement, uncleanness, are not acceptable unto God. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. This kind of work. It's not acceptable unto God. Let's go back to Isaiah and see what God is revealing unto us. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. Bring no more vain oblation. Incest is an abomination unto me. The new moon and the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. Is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, your new moon and your appointed feast, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to be them. And when you spread forth your hand, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayer, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Defy hand, defy, defy heart, heart that is watching pornography, masturbation, heart that is filled with bitterness, envy and jealousy, mouth that is scandalous, that will blackmail and lie and cheat and deceive others. And not accept, whatever service such a person render is not acceptable unto God. 
In chapter 52, Isaiah 52, we are reading in verse 11. Isaiah 52, verse 11. Isaiah 52, verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean, that bear the vessel of the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, here we are admonished to prepare, to present our body, a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know, it's making a reflection to the Old Testament system. The worshiper bring an animal to sacrifice to God. That animal should have no blemish, should not be blind, should not be lame, should not be sick, should be healthy and strong before it can be accepted and the priest will examine it and then it can now be presented unto God. So he's saying, not an animal now but your body. That includes your heart, that includes your eyes, that includes your thoughts, that includes your imagination, all the embodiment of your spirit, soul, and body be presented unto God without blemish, without defilement. In verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. What's the meaning of that? Don't copy them. Don't copy them. Their festival, their fashion, their ceremony, their tradition, their wickedness, their politics, and all the evil things they are doing. Copy not. That's what the Bible is saying. All the fashion of the world that some people are running after, the painting and the tying this and the tattoo and all the things of the world that some people preoccupy themselves with. The Bible says, copy not. Don't follow them. Let not, don't make them your standard or your example. It says again, and as I read in verse 2 again, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. How do you do that? You get into the world, the word of God, the mirror that will show you where you are, who you are, what is yet to be done and what has been done and what needs to be done. How you should walk in the light and speed up in your commitment and service. How you should reconsecrate and serve the Lord. He said that ye may, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And perfect will of God. The end is imminent. Our Lord we soon appear in the sky to take home his ready bride. Are you ready? Are you prepared? First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading verse 52. First Corinthians 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the trump, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The changing here is not talking of sanctification. He's talking of the, our body being transformed to immortal body, celestial body. That's the change he's talking about here. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, remain in the light, remain in service, shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hence, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with this word. Brethren, how ready are you? How prepared are you? The coming of the Lord is imminent. Are you ready? Is there something to settle, something to correct? Any defilement within, any scandal, anything that you need to restitute? 
delay, delay not. Let there be no presumption. In Luke chapter 12, verse 40. Luke chapter 12, verse 40. Be ye therefore ready. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. The Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Let's rise up and take what the Lord has revealed unto us to him in prayer. Are you in the light? Are you walking in the light? Is your garment spotless, white as snow, or are there stain? Stain of unforgiveness, of slander, of backbiting, of bitterness, of anger. Are your eyes pure from pornography? Your finger not touching unclean thing? Talk to God in prayer. This is preparation for his coming. This is getting ready. Be ye ready. Be ye ready. This is getting ready. Talk to God in prayer. And if there's something to repent of, do it now. If there's something to correct, do it now. Restitution is to make, make a promise and immediately promptly. The psalmist say, I make haste, I delay not, to keep your status, to keep your commandment. Pray. Don't be presumptuous. Don't assume. As the Spirit of God pinpoints specific area of your life, as the Spirit of God is shining light into the corners of your heart and is prompting you how about this, how about this, how about this, no argument, no excuse. Set to it and cry to God for mercy. This is the day of opportunity. The blood of Jesus is still washing whiter than snow. And you can be cleansed and made ready. Talk to God in prayer. Be prepared. Clean up. If we walk in the light, and we must walk in the light. The blood of Jesus' is Son cleanses us from every stain. Clean up. Think through. Make reflection. As you cry to God in prayer, Oh Lord, here am I. Search me, O oh God, that anything in my heart that will hinder me when the Lord appear in the sky that will prevent me from going at the rapture so that you can amend, you can correct it now. Talk to God in prayer. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Seek for mercy. Seek for pardon. Remember, he or she that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he that confesses, he that forsakes shall have mercy. Clean up, be ready. Scandals, biting, gossip, clean up, be ready. Bitterness, unforgiving spirits, intention to retaliate, clean up and be ready. And then commitment to the world. Let's come before the Lord and reconsecrate our service to the Lord. There is a call for volunteers, volunteers, soldiers for the conflict, those who will labor in his vineyard, who will lay on the altar of sacrifice, time, talent, and treasure. That can be you. That can be me. All of us can. There's more to do. There's work for everyone in the vineyard of the Lord. Let's talk to God in prayer as we rededicate and consecrate our life to God. And let's be sure that we render valuable service. Services that are acceptable. Services that are pure in the sight of God. Worthy service. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. We bless your name. We thank you for this awakening to look inward, may reflection and check up and make sure that there's no impediment anywhere to clean up and to amend and make restitution where necessary in preparation and readiness for your coming. Thank you, Father, for the clarion call that we should be ready 
Thank you for the privilege to serve, to renew our commitment, and to lay our sacrifice upon the altar of consecration and serve zealously and serve holily and serve with determination in your vineyard in jesus name we pray oh god will not labor in vain we pray we will not harden our heart we pray oh god that grace will be abundant the courage to correct what needs to be corrected you will give to us lord in jesus name and then the commitment and renewal of consecration and doing more and more and more before the coming of the Lord. Grant us grace to do more in Jesus' name. We thank you for the answer. We bless your name and worship. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.